Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida, here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Hey everybody, welcome to the Work From Home Show. Shout out to all our homies, homeboys, homegirls, home trans, all the Work From Homers out there. I'm Naresh Vissa. Adam's not able to join us again today, but that's okay because we have someone who I think is one of the biggest name guests we've had on this show. He's one of the most controversial guests who we're having on the show. I don't know where exactly the controversy is. We're going to get into that. We're going to have a really, really deep discussion on the pandemic, which was the reason why we started this show in March 2020. So it is the root, you might say, well, why are we talking about the pandemic? Well, there would be no work from home show without the pandemic. And on top of that, the pandemic has certainly affected the public policy. The health policy has affected the way people work from home, whether mandates, lockdown mandates, vaccine mandates are even relevant for work from homers. We'll talk about all this stuff and we'll get into some science. Our science and health episodes do actually even better than our business episodes as we've explained at the end of every year in our wrap up, our, our, our year, annual wrap up episode. So without further ado, who is this guest? He is the inventor of the mRNA technology behind COVID vaccines. He's a number one best-selling Wall Street Journal author of the new book, Lies My Government Told Me, and the better future coming. He's been on, I don't want to say every mainstream news media network because he's actually been silenced or banned by most of the mainstream news media. But his episode with Joe Rogan was one of the most listened to podcast episodes ever, ever. Dr. Robert Malone, thank you so much for joining us on the Work From Home show. Hi, Naresh, and, and hello to uh, all of all of the fellow homies. Uh, I've been working from home now, uh, plus traveling, I think, pretty much all the way through this, uh, just like the rest of us. Were you working from home even before that? Let's get a little bit into your background, because I know you are, like I said, you have a doctor in front of your name, so I, I know that you have an MD. I'm not sure if you have a PhD. And just tell us a little bit about about your background working in big pharma, as well as how you invented the mRNA technology. Well, that'll be a three hour podcast right there. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. So where to begin on that? Uh, I, I have been running a consulting business now for a few decades, uh, but have also worked for uh, Solve Pharmaceuticals, which is a medium to large, uh, it's been sold off now to Abbott. Uh, and uh, I've worked for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, both for PATH as a consultant and as an employee uh, for Aris Global TV Vaccine Foundation. That is now defunct. Uh, they failed to produce an improved t tuberculosis vaccine. I've worked for the government uh, Dyneport Vaccine Company uh, at various um, uh, Beltway Bandits. I've held uh, secret clearance with the Department of Defense. Much of my work, I've been an academic for many years, uh, rising to the level of associate professor. I have both a, a MD and I'm licensed to practice in the state of Maryland, as well as an MS. I took my MS in lieu of PhD because I had a nervous breakdown basically and, and PTSD after the series of events that followed my discoveries as a young man that we that are now recognized as the origins of the mRNA vaccine technology and mRNA as a drug. Uh, uh, so I've, I, I've worked for 
uh, numerous contract research organizations in clinical research. I've completed a, a fellowship at Harvard Medical School. Um, I'm technically a graduate of both Harvard Med and Northwestern Med, which is where I got my MD. Uh, the fellowship at Harvard was in global clinical research. Uh, so I'm, I'm formally trained in uh, clinical research and then have now decades of experience in uh, preparing and managing clinical trials, designing trials. Also in regulatory affairs, I've worked for a Rockville-based regulatory affairs uh, um, specialty contract research organization under a former FDA uh, um, reviewer who was actually responsible for the licensing package for AZT. Uh, she'd actually locked horns with Tony Fauci back in the day. Uh, I'm trained as a molecular virologist and immunologist. I have uh, over 100 publications, uh, chaired or um, attended uh, as a speaker, hundreds of conferences, scientific conferences, uh, have many patents, uh, including nine that are directly relevant to the mRNA technology platform. One that I share with my wife, uh, which was for mucosal polynucleotide vaccines that covers the use of any gene therapy technology for purpose of eliciting a mucosal immune response. That's now a hot topic suddenly again. Uh, so I have, I'm one of the few that have a very broad base of experience across government, non-governmental organizations, uh, large pharma, small startup environments. I've done multiple startups myself uh, and um, have been very active as a consultant for many years and working out of my home. I've been working out of my home uh, for a couple of decades now and in some cases have to go into the office for the client, but in many cases I've just been operating our consultancy via the usual Zoom and Skype. Okay, let's let's talk about that uh, because that's obviously super relevant to, to work from home. So initially you said you were working from home through the pandemic and then you topped it off by saying you've been working from home doing all this. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but you use a lot of big words and uh, it, it seems like you're obviously very accomplished. You did all of this pretty much working from home outside of speaking at conferences, visiting some clients on site here and there. Yeah, that's that's uh, always been my preferred way. There's been periods <clears throat> where I've been having to go into an office on a regular daily basis, but uh, for the most part, it's my preference to work from home, and it, it's it's been um, uh, made possible in part by my background in education. Uh, and my experience has been that you always have to take time to build interpersonal relationships in person with your client or coworkers. But once you establish that in in my business area, which is very uh, thought intensive and writing intensive and communication intensive, it's been my experience that I can be as productive or typically more productive by working from home than working on site and having to deal with uh, a lot of the um, chatter and and uh, side issues that can crop up in a modern corporate environment. Uh, so that's just been my experience and my preference. I, my wife and I have uh, run small farms. This is our fifth since we were teenagers, really. Oh, and wow. uh, so this allows me to have a hybrid then? lifestyle where uh, we have our horses, we we produce foals. Um, right now we have four on the ground and one still in the oven. And uh, and I can still uh, also interact in the professional space and and uh, do so really quite smoothly in in this era where everything is so information intensive. It has a lot more to do with uh, what you know and how you can access and process information and then communicate. And I've developed very good communication skills 
in this kind of uh, uh, virtual environment that we all share now. It For me, working in clinical research, this is an international enterprise. So it's always been the case that much of my business, whether I'm on site or, or at home, is conducted at odd hours. You know, if I have clients in Australia or Europe, which is often the case, then um, I have to adjust to their time frames. Or, or for instance, even clients in India, which is a challenge sometimes. Australia and India I find particularly challenging, but uh, you just have to be willing to uh, have your have your Zoom conferences or teleconferences late at night or in the early hours of the morning and then catch some naps and and uh, go on with your day. Uh, but that's that's always been the case in clinical research because it's a international enterprise. So for me, it was fairly painless to transition into the, uh, we, you know, it's so overused, the new normal of, of uh, the business uh, environment of today. So you, so you and your wife have been together since you were teenagers, you said? Yeah, we just had our 44th wedding anniversary uh, last Friday. That's impressive. And and so you also, I wouldn't say you work from home. You work from farm. You work from your farm. That that would be a better way to put it, most likely. Well, farm is home. Uh, farm is so. home, yeah. <laughs> but uh, when people we don't have a townhouse. Home, home is boring. Home is like, oh, yeah, everyone has homes. But we're, you're our first guest who, who works from, from their farm. So... I wanted to let you know you're not just the inventor of mRNA technology, but you're also the work from home show's first guest who works from their farm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I drive a tractor and my wife thinks it's sexy. Uh, and, nice. um, and I can run a chainsaw. I was originally a carpenter and a farmhand before I was a physician and a scientist. So for me, this all comes natural and I, and I really enjoy this kind of slightly schizophrenic life that I lead where I can move back and forth between virtual and physical space. So here's what I like about that, because I am surrounded by physicians. I'm married to one. I would say like close to half of my circle or friend circle uh, is science related, whether physician or scientist. And you you definitely what, what I'm trying to get out, he, get out here, you, you brought up the term creativity and thinking. And I feel like in your situation, driving tractors and using chainsaws, you're able to be more creative and think outside the box and not follow some dusty old, uh, as they call it, peer-reviewed journal that could have that could be incorrect, that that could be flawed in some way, that could have money behind it, uh, and you're able to think more than the person who's just going to a hospital, going to a lab, dealing with the politics, like you said, the the distractions and coming home. And and I, I, I didn't know that about you, but now I'm starting to see how you think. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I've, I've been, you know, I, I can, I've often in the past been, for instance, study section chair for uh, peer review and award of multi-hundred million dollar contracts. I've captured for my clients literally billions and billions of dollars in contract funding. Um, and I have many peer reviewed publications. Uh, and I was all in at the start of this outbreak in continuing to use the peer review system and standard scientific journals as the venue for publication of the scientific work that I was doing. But uh, during this outbreak, that process has been compromised. And uh, it's become impossible to, uh, or functionally impossible, to publish fully independent work in this area of vaccine safety, drug repurposing, uh, COVID treatment. Uh, even if you're backed by hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts from the Department of Defense, uh, it 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 has really the last three years have been transformational in terms of of how to communicate uh, scientific information. And uh, once I basically walked away from the peer review system because of how dysfunctional it had become, 
I I did become uh, much. I was freed up in terms of what I could think about, what I could communicate, um, the uh, interpretations and results that I was able to uh, process and share. And I think that has been important in enabling me to uh, speak these uh, inconvenient truths through the pandemic, particularly the last two years regarding both uh, repurposed drugs and vaccines. These these things that have resulted, as you mentioned in the in the lead in, in my being identified as a controversial figure and gaslit and harassed and all the above. Uh, but um, because I've been free from constraints, I've been able to follow the data and uh, make my comments based on a data-based analysis. And I, because I've been trained as a uh, as a expert witness by some very uh, large key TAM firms, legal firms, I I've been very aware that one has to avoid speculating about people's motives or what they're thinking or what's going on in their mind. And so I've just refused to do that. The consequence of all this is that my predictions have often seemed prescient. Uh, people um, have used terms at, at times as, as if I was a prophet in some way, but it's it's just been that I've been freed up. I haven't had to worry about bureaucratic or, or uh, supervisor job constraints. I've been free to speak uh, truth and interpret the data as I see it, which of course is how science should be. But uh, very few in in the in the current environment have that liberty. Uh, so it's it's uh, I'm sure that uh, many many uh, could have had a similar track record had they not been constrained in the way that they have been. Uh, but uh, and and uh, you know relevant to your audience. The, the fact that I've been able to operate autonomously in this home-based environment with a uh, an intellectual peer that I interact with every morning, that being my wife, who's a PhD uh, and has always been a partner in everything that we've done together. We, it's not, you know, I hear people say, oh, behind every great man is a great woman, which I object to. Uh, we are we're partners. We walk side by side. I don't walk behind her. She doesn't walk behind me. You follow? Yeah, absolutely. That sounds really, really good. And you brought up, or, or it seems that you're a busy guy as far as your clients go. You work with corporations, you work with companies, and I'm curious to know because the media, if you go on Wikipedia or Google or just the mainstream news media, it's nothing but negativity. It's Robert Malone is a quack. He's a fake scientist. He he uh, doesn't practice medicine or hasn't really practiced it. He's a conspiracy theorist. And um, I'm just, it, I think it's fascinating that the corporations haven't followed suit. It's like two different narratives. You've got all these clients on one hand, and then you have the media saying that you're just this fake, uneducated person. What do your clients have to say? Do, are your clients like, look, Robert Malone is brilliant. We want to put him on staff, so, retainer, so whatever. So one of the things that I've always brought to uh, my client relationships is that I'm I'm known as someone who will speak truth. So much of my business has been with C-suite individuals, uh, chief executive and chief science, um, chief operating officer, et cetera. And... Uh, over time, it's become more and more coaching uh, and serving as a independent sounding board uh, to help them avoid the problems of sycophants and and that kind of behavior that permeates much of corporate culture these days. So speaking truth to power has been kind of my brand for quite a while. Since the uh, I since this there was this concerted effort to write me out of history concerning my early inventions and my speaking out 
at about the same time concerning the bioethics of what was being done uh, and and my concerns about the uh, failure to follow well-established regulatory norms in moving these vaccines forward and also in my efforts with the Department of Defense to repurpose drugs and advance clinical trials for those, including for ivermectin, which was blocked by the FDA. I mean, the FDA would not allow the DOD to perform clinical research on ivermectin. You know, take take a moment to process that. Uh, so, so it's always been my brand to uh, speak honestly, earnestly, and clearly. And it's been uh, something that's become valued by uh, particularly larger clients. Uh, the smaller ones just kind of need their hands held through the process. And there aren't very many people that understand discovery research or bench research and uh, the advanced development part that it takes to move a product through the regulatory process and clinical trials process. I, I'm fairly unusual in having that full breadth of capability. And so the smaller ones um, seek me out for that. Since I've been speaking out, uh, I, I really had to make a choice. The, the, in, as a consultant in this space, your clients typically don't want you to have a high profile. They want you to keep your head down, uh, help them, allow them to take credit for what's being done, and uh, not to be active in social media, etc. And so that's long been my practice is to uh, keep my head down and and just focus on supporting the client, the customer. And uh, this cascade of events and my conscious choice to bypass uh, traditional corporate media and and much of social media by going to alternative media, the podcast, et cetera, and Substack is is. Uh, really not consistent with what most uh, clients in this biopharmaceutical space want, nor with the Department of Defense. So I've had to kind of cut myself loose. I have, and, and basically our consulting business has stopped. I still get pinged for uh, small jobs in, in, you know, often with Wall Street analysts. And uh, I have some uh, longer uh, interests, uh, uh, clients, um, kind of sniffing about now that all of the, the dust is settling on the COVID crisis and it's become clear that I wasn't a, a crazy whack job, but rather I was the one who was calling things correctly. And, and the likes of Tony Fauci and Rochelle Walensky were the one and the WHO were the ones getting it wrong. So with that comes a certain, uh, credibility. And uh, so I am having larger clients start to kind of uh, inquire, but I'm so busy. Uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I have six podcasts and, and interviews today. Uh, I just got back from Connecticut for the uh, Brownstone retreat. Uh, before that, I was called to uh, um, speak uh, to a group of conservative MPs in London on short notice uh, and uh, support Andrew Bridgen, uh, who had been railroaded out of the Conservative Party by Rishi Sunak, the uh, con current um, prime minister in the UK. So I, I, I'm pretty much traveling and engaged on a nonstop basis and we we my wife and I put out our Substack essays on a daily basis, pretty much seven days a week, and have done so now for well over a year. And that that uh, we we run the Substack as a subscription service that does not require anyone to pay. So you can find that at rwmalonemd.substack.com. And those that subscribe do so voluntarily, they're not required to do so. And the advantage they get is they can communicate, they can 
uh, participate in the chats for the Substack articles, which uh, does a great job of keeping the trolls down to a dull roar yep. and allows kind of a, a great intellectual space. And that generates enough revenue that uh, we're, we're doing just fine uh, based on basically voluntary donations uh, um, coming from those that uh, largely were already subscribing for free and then make a decision that they're getting enough value that they want to go ahead and support us. So that's become our new business model and uh, is, is really diving in as authors and uh, um, uh, providing opinion and commentary and interpretation and teaching. I mean, I just, I'd spend hours and hours and hours basically uh, teaching people and coaching just as I used to do for my clients. But now it's paradoxically for, for the, all of the Western world, it seems. How many paying subscribers do you have on Substack? So we, we keep that confidential, uh, okay. f forgive me, but it's, it's uh, significant, uh, greater than 10,000. And uh, um, our overall subscription is approaching 300,000 for Substack, but our daily views um, on our articles, because we also push them out through social media. And for instance, I have uh, a million uh, 40,000 followers on Twitter, I think right now. Uh, and that's and, after you were reinstated, right? Right, I was under half a million uh, as of last December. Uh, and had having been blocked or or deplatformed for a year, and I have oh. about half a million on Getter. All told, I'm I'm about 1.8 million, and the Substack routinely reaches, uh, you know, when uh, between uh, direct subscriptions and indirect views, it it's typically reaching about half a million to a million people a day. So that is equal to or exceeding uh, primetime CNN uh, broadcasting, by the way. Uh, the, the cumulative monthly is enormous. Uh, we, in, so we are very glad to have, uh, to enable the platform to be used by other authors that are producing relevant work. So we will republish or, or publish articles um, on that uh, from time to time, which gives us a little break, but uh, it's it's a job, uh, and we treat it. We treat our customers, our, our our subscribers, as customers and clients, just like we've always done, and uh, respect them, value their feedback, listen to what they say, and uh, um, we treat the uh, alternative media, including Substack, as a business, uh, just as we would have for our consulting business. We get up every morning and produce our essay and and uh, after we we think about and process what, what the news of the world is and what's the latest about COVID it, and the latest about propaganda and censorship, et cetera. And I find myself also in a position that I really didn't ask for of, of being identified as a global leader in this space and uh, so I take that very seriously. Also, it's it's not something that I've sought, uh, and it and it is a challenging role to just step into, given how complex the global situation is. And I I do my best to do so responsibly. Uh, the uh, attacks um, and and uh, derision and uh, um defamation, uh, often malicious defamation, are, are a pain, but it's just, it's just the way modern media is. It's, there's nothing personal here. If you're saying things that are contrary to the approved narrative coming from World Health Organization, the Trusted News Initiative, or the CDC, you will be attacked in this way. You will have your Wikipedia a listing aggressively edited by uh, people that are associated with uh, the intelligence community. This is just the the facts of modern life in in media and communications. When you get a sufficiently large profile, we we are absolutely in an era of unrestricted information warfare. Uh, I I speak about this fairly often about fifth generation warfare, 
and the psyops that had been uh, deployed against civilian populations. And uh, so it's it's uh, no surprise, and, and I don't take it personally, frankly, that uh, these techniques and technologies are deployed against me. Uh, the challenge is finding ways to navigate that environment and maintain your own personal dignity and not uh, not fall into uh, anger or uh, uh, a dis, you know trying to retaliate or uh, allowing yourself to be pushed into extremist positions. There, in this modern media landscape, it is extremely complex. Uh, fifth generation warfare is is a just a torturous terrain where uh, it's very difficult to discern what is truth. And uh, intentionally, you can never tell who is behind what is happening. That's one of the key parameters in fifth generation warfare is you should never be able to identify who is the perpetrator uh, that is pushing these ideas and information into the population. And, and the people, whoever's doing this is very successful in that. It's very hard to tell who's really behind all of the messaging and the coordination with the COVID crisis. But what's been fascinating for me, I, you know, just to illustrate, I traveled over 400,000 uh, commercial miles last year and uh, air miles and all of the world. And, uh, um, you know, for instance, uh, next week I'll be going to Mexico City to testify to the Mexican Senate, previously testified to the uh, uh, Italian Senate in Rome, uh, will be testifying and holding hearings in the European Parliament uh, in a month. So that's that's kind of how I bounce around. And as a consequence, I get to encounter people from all over the world. And what has really been fascinating and illuminating is that the very language, the techniques of the language, the approach that is being used in all of these uh, gaslighting and censorship campaigns have been harmonized all over the Western world the same techniques it, down to the level of, for instance, this massive purchase of influencers, artists, comedians, musicians, etc., that was done early on to uh, compel and, and entice them to uh, um, uh, advocate for the interests of the state in, in terms of the lockdowns, masking, uh, vaccine products, etc. This was all globally coordinated. Uh, just as now we're seeing the uh, agenda having to do with uh, um, these these new uh, issues relating to uh, gender fluidity, that that also is all being coordinated globally. The same messaging is happening in U.S. schools that's happening in South African schools, for example. I want our listeners to listen to all that again and appreciate how successful you have become because of the pandemic, despite all the deplatforming, you were canceled on Facebook, canceled on all social media, Google, Wikipedia. It's you were either canceled or it was just negative, bad stuff about you. And despite all that, you found ways to reach huge audiences, to grow your over half a million substack on Wikipedia. They claim over 30, I know you said you don't want to share it, but they claim over 30,000 paying subscribers. Regardless, that's a lot. Uh, whether it's thirty thousand or a hundred thousand, anything more than ten thousand, you're in the top one percent on on Substack. So, uh, I, I want people to understand that despite despite the odds, despite the the criticisms, despite the detractors, if you're at home and you have knowledge, you have you want to improve yourself, you have an expertise, you can make it whether you're a scientist or a doctor or a business person or whatever, you can thrive. You can do extremely, extremely well, even if the internet, even if Google is against you. Yeah. So I like to, in my lectures uh, these days to larger audiences, uh, and, and one of my themes historically has been to try to stop the um, deployment of the jabs against children, uh, particularly very young, because there's no rationale. The risk-benefit ratio does not uh, support 
using these genetic vaccine products in children at all. And, and I knew I couldn't stop the momentum on the adult vaccination, but I thought I could make an impact on childhood vaccines. And in fact, the uptake of both the childhood vaccines and the boosters, which I've also spoken out about, has been quite low. So I, I take some comfort that, that I've been successful together with my peers, uh, the other physicians uh, in our group in the Global COVID Summit, and we represent over 17,000 physicians and medical scientists. So, uh, I, you know, the quote from St. Augustine, the famous quote that, that I've kind of uh, amplified a bit, uh, the truth is like a lion. You don't need to defend it, set it free, it will defend itself. That it defends itself slowly, but uh, it it is um, unstoppable. Uh, it, once you get it out, you know, the other, the contrary version of that is that uh, a lie can circle the world twice before uh, the truth gets its shoes on. And both are true. But if you, if you are patient, calm, fact-based, uh, and persistent, you can absolutely uh, have an impact and, and uh, get your, your voice and information heard through modern media that, that the, uh, you know, the alternative media, the, the corporate media business model is collapsing. That's, that's the, the reason why I say that about CNN primetime viewership is that here you have uh, a couple in their 60s, myself and my wife, and now we have a couple of part-time folks that help us on uh, some topic areas and, and also with Instagram and, and WhatsApp and uh, TikTok. And uh, uh, we're, we're able to reach an audience that exceeds that of uh, the cable news network uh, with all of their infrastructure and, and personnel and overhead expenses. So by being uh, nimble and humble, uh, we're we're able to uh, cut through uh, the censorship and the legacy media structure. And and corporate media is well aware of this. They uh, um, there are uh, like the Pointer Institute's uh, reports and many of the think tanks about that are supported by corporate media are really starting to raise alarm bells that the business model of the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and, and MSNBC and, and the majors is failing. And uh, particularly in the younger cohort and the one that is you know notoriously reached by Joe Rogan, the 20 somethings, they approach information as more of a Chinese menu where they're selecting from different sources. They may want to listen to Jordan Peterson. They may want to listen to me. They may want to listen to you. Uh, and they can select that as kind of a menu and, and flip them on when they're in their car or while they're working on their laptop, et cetera, and listen or, or in other ways absorb the information or read for those that still read. This is, this is the new media landscape, and it is absolutely disrupting uh, corporate media and the old way of doing things. And those sources like the New York Times and the Washington Post are increasingly uh, staffed by information bubble. They talk to the other journalists and they talk to the elite uh, that they have been co-trained with at, at you know, top journalism schools, et cetera. And they don't really connect with uh, the rest of America very well. We hear about this, you know, this is the stereotype about flyover states, but uh, they're increasingly disassociated. And as a consequence, no surprise, the business models are failing. So I do encourage folks to, to get involved in alternative media. Uh, Jill and I intentionally threw ourselves into the podcast. Uh, you know, when I first went on the Brett Weinstein podcast, Dark Horse podcast, I hardly knew what podcasting was. I was really intimidated by Brett. And, uh, but I was getting all this flack from corporate media and, and uh, the censorship 
and shadow banning. And so I just decided together with my wife to throw ourselves into this. And and it's uh, turned out to be very successful. We caught it at a moment where things were growing rapidly and they still are. Uh, so that's, you know, that I, I really appreciate your encouraging people and uh, you're an example of of the power of new media to reach audiences. And in my experience, each separate podcast is really connecting to a different group of people uh, with different backgrounds, different culture. They, they've really self-assembled into uh, kind of a self-autonomous pods, decentralized uh, uh, interest groups. And I think it's just absolutely wonderful to dive into that and participate in, in this sea of humanity that that has all this diversity and is rejecting this these the logic of uh, centralized global control that is being so actively uh, propagated on all of us. Over. So I wanna I know you gotta to go in in ten to fifteen minutes or so. So I wanna go over some actual scientific stuff because we have a lot of listeners who are at home. They're working at home. They have kids who go to school or who are homeschooled. They're at home. They were forced to get the jab, as I like to call it, because it's it's not a vaccine. And and so I want to I want to help explain what happened and what can be expected moving forward. Before we do that, I'm just going to share a few uh, areas that the mainstream news media has criticized you on. And I'm going to debunk, not debunk, but basically say, look, you were right this has been debunked. So on your Wikipedia, it says you misled people by popularizing ivermectin. Well, now it turns out there it's peer reviewed. I'm, I, 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 my background's in journalism. Uh, initially now I'm a business guy, so I, I know how to research and follow the science as they call it really and follow the money really well. So there's a large, large body of research of peer-reviewed research that backs ivermectin. There's data analysis studies. We'll post this in our show notes. So you were right about that. Wikipedia and the mainstream news media, wrong. Another one, uh, questioning vaccine safety. Well, all you have to do, just type in Moderna vaccine banned in Iceland, banned in Sweden, banned in Nordic countries. The Moderna vaccine, just read all about it. If, if you got the Moderna vaccine, I'll let you share a little bit more well, about the, it. But the UK government is now stopping the boosters for everybody. They'd already stopped yeah. it for 15 below. Well, there's another one because you were called it all sorts of names when you said, as you brought up earlier, the children uh, should not be getting the vaccine. Where I live in Florida, the the state surgeon general said did not recommend that anyone under 40 get the job and again i I know i don't joke pretty well by the way um yeah that's dr ladapo we've been trying to get him on the show and and uh, again we're going to post this study in our show notes there are countless studies that show especially for boys i have two young boys and i'm a considered a young man because i'm under the age of 40 that uh that getting the jab is, it, there, there's more risk in getting an mRNA jab than getting COVID itself. And that's the, why the overall way, serious that, adverse event rate seems to be in the range of about one in 500. And the clinically significant myocarditis incident rate post jab seems to be in the range of about one in 2000. Those aren't small numbers. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, and, and I want to quickly run through this because this, this is good. We're, we're covering a lot. But look, I want to I want to share. I'm jabbed. I got vaccinated, but I stayed the heck away from the mRNAs. I got the J&J uh, one shot jab. Then I got the J&J booster. And and maybe I'm wrong here. Please tell me if I'm wrong. But from from the research I read, it was look, if 90 days go by, some people said 30 days. Like if 90 days go by, you're good, everything's good, then the vaccine is safe, it's effective. So that's why when the boosters came out, um, I I did get the bivalent booster and I'm regretting it now. Should I be regretting it? I actually just booked an appointment to see a cardiologist because I do feel like my heartbeat 
it's not that I feel I know I, I, I went in for a quick physical and I definitely have high cholesterol, high blood sugar. My heart beats up. Uh, I, I mean, is it from the vax? Maybe not. I, it, so so I also I took yeah. two doses of Moderna early on uh, really? before we knew about the adverse events. And uh, I took them because I had to travel internationally and that wouldn't be possible. And I had long COVID because I was in the first wave of infection. I got infected at the end of February with the original Wuhan strain when I was at a MIT drug discovery conference in, in Boston and uh, developed very severe COVID symptoms. I thought I was going to die uh, and began treating myself with some of the drugs that we'd identified in the DOD through computational tools, which is what led to the discovery of famotidine which is another one that's now been validated as having activity. But uh, um, but I took the Moderna products, and in dose number two, I received one of the known bad lots. You can find that. Um, uh, I think the website is How Bad Is My Batch. You can look that up and, and type in your lot number. But I received one of the bad lots of Moderna, and I developed hypertension to 230 systolic. Um, and... Uh, Tachycardia, as you're saying, uh, POTS, uh, postural orthostatic hypertension, um, narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, tinnitus, of course, very common adverse event, um, some dizziness, uh, symptoms that at the time were unknown to be associated with the vaccine toxicity, but are now widely accepted. So uh, you and I are both vaccine damaged, so it would seem. Uh, and even though I got the so the J and J is not mRNA, it's the adenovirus. What? Well, let's 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 open that can of worms just for a moment, okay? okay. Uh, Please do. The, even even the Novavax product, which is produces the spike protein in caterpillar cells, which it's then purified from as small vesicles uh, containing the protein. In that case, you still have the cardiotoxicity and coagulopathy. So the blood clotting problems, because those are due to the spike. This is another thing I was criticized for, is stating that spike is a toxin, and, and that's now pretty widely acknowledged. If you want a short list of stuff I said that they attacked me for, but then uh, time has proven that I got it correct, there's a great Business Insider article attacking me. Uh, I think it's uh, in in the month after the Joe Rogan hit, so that would be January of 22. And uh, you read that thing, and it's all experts saying, oh, no, he's wrong about this, that, and the other thing. And, and you look in retrospect, and every single thing I said was right. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, you know, but getting back on point about the toxicity. Uh, so Novavax has, just with a purified protein, a lot of these toxicities, uh, the adenovirus vector also has the cardiotoxicity and the coagulopathy problems. This is part of the reason why it was downplayed. Uh, another was political. Uh, and, and now we have Moderna's phase three trials of their mRNA-based influenza vaccine has failed because it didn't meet the safety endpoint. In other words, the formulations themselves, even in the absence of spike protein, at a lower dose are still sufficiently toxic that the product is not able to proceed towards licensure after phase three testing. And that's in an environment in which the FDA has a very strong pro uh, licensure bias towards this technology. So so it's, it's clear if you look across the different platforms and different ways of producing spike protein and uh, the different formulations that both the lipid nanoparticles themselves with the uh, pseudo RNA, because it's not really natural mRNA, it has all these pseudo uridines in it that changes its properties um, in terms of toxicity and uh, stability. But uh, w when you look across all these different vaccine platforms, what you see is that virtually every single component of these uh, products uh, the formulations involving the uh, genetic vaccines and the mRNA in particular 
uh, has intrinsic toxicity. Now, with the adenovectors, which is what you're talking about with J and J, this is a, an old gene therapy technology. It actually was pioneered at the same time in the same laboratory that I was at in the Salk Institute in the late 80s by a guy named Dinko Valerio that created a company called Crucell, originally as a gene therapy company using adenoviral vectors, and then um, uh, came to me a couple years later and said, Robert, you're right, we should focus on vaccines, not gene therapy. He redirected his company and that company, Crucell, then got sold to Johnson & Johnson. So it's ironic that both of these technologies trace back to the same laboratory in the late 80s. But uh, um, the adenoviral vectors have been tested extensively in the past. Very few have achieved licensure for vaccines. But these profile of this profile of adverse events like the coagulopathy and myocarditis has not been part of the adverse events associated with the platform itself. And so that again makes it possible to conclude scientifically based on the data that there is intrinsic toxicity uh, to the spike protein payload uh, in addition to whatever adverse events are associated with the delivery system. So that it's now, the, the data are quite clear and I'd also predicted last summer in sworn testimony to the Texas State Senate that these boosters would uh, further exacerbate the problem of immune imprinting, which is one of the core problems that's going on with these repeated jabs. And uh, that's now also accepted, uh, and it's, it's widely accepted in many areas, even by Bill Gates, that these uh, booster quote unquote products are a failure. Uh, and, and they really confer toxicity risk without uh, therapeutic benefit, uh, significant therapeutic benefit. And, and in the uh, um, study from the Cleveland Clinic, very, very large uh, study from a highly qualified clinical research unit uh, involving Cleveland Clinic employees, they've shown very clearly that the more inoculations you receive, you call them jabs, uh, they call them vaccines, uh, but the more inoculations you receive, the more likely you are to get COVID. This has to do with the damage that's being done to your immune system and this problem of immune imprinting where it's focusing your immune response on a obsolete antigen that's no longer circulating. So your body tries to respond to the old uh, Wuhan 1 or the original Omicron that is encoded in that a new booster bivalent product. And uh, the currently circulating viruses have already uh, evolved to escape those types of antibody responses. So uh, you get the uh, problem of the damage to your immune response, the focusing, inappropriate focusing, and the vector sum of all of that is that uh, people that take these repeated inoculations are actually the ones at highest risk for dying or developing the clinical disease. And you know that from your, you know, just being around and talking to people, your relatives, your coworkers, et cetera. It's, it's pretty much self-evident if you have your eyes open. You don't need uh, big data to figure it out. Over? Completely, completely uh, agree with you. I do want to say that we could go on for hours and hours. I was actually a guest on a podcast. It, the interview lasted three hours because we were talking about all this. We're not going to do that. Like I said, a lot of this stuff is going to be in our show notes. Uh, but the mainstream news media did attack you because you said that COVID zero wouldn't become a thing. Uh, the vaccines wouldn't create COVID zero. They said that was misinformation. And as we see, or as we have seen these vaccine or jabs, whatever they call it there. The reason why I got it, I knew that these were not fully effective. I knew that even if I got a jab, I, in fact, I wanted to get infected. Like I was very late. Only recently I got infected for the first time, but after I got jabbed, I said, look, natural infection is the best way to fight this. Like I want to get it, like give me COVID type of thing call me stupid. A lot of people call me smart, but I finally got it. And I feel so much better mentally that. Yes. Now, yeah. Now, the, the relief of having confronted anymore. your fear and overcome it uh, can really be uh, freeing to many people. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to get COVID 
after getting the jab. I didn't want to be unvaxxed in and get the jab or, or sorry, get COVID. But after getting these series of shots and boosters, I finally got the virus. I had proof of it in a test. I had all the symptoms. They were it wasn't bad. It was like a cold. But now I just feel better and I'm not going to I said I'm done. No more jabs, no more. Uh, Good. boosters or, or any yeah, of that. Yeah, that's that's that that position is well supported by the data, frankly. Good. I'm I'm happy about that. And and I think a good example is is Sweden, as you know, I'm sure you've covered it, Sweden. They oh, I was just there three weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, they didn't do the lockdowns, they didn't do any mandates, mass mandates, no vaccine mandates. Yeah, Sweden is a little complicated. It's not quite so clean. Um uh, they did promote the vaccine and many people were vaccinated. So it's kind of a hybrid situation. Uh, um, and the Swedes are fairly compliant. Uh, the old uh, um, uh, ethic of, of uh, warrior uh, Vikings is pretty much washed out of Swedish culture now, I'm afraid. Uh, so they, they, they pretty much did what they were told and many of them are vaccinated. So it's not quite as clear. But absolutely, they didn't lock down their schools. They didn't do the things that we've done to our children. And, and, uh, and they absolutely have not been as authoritarian in forcing uh, vaccine uptake in the same way that many Western nations have. And they're not even in the top 55 in death per capita or hospitalizations per, per capita. Well, this so, is one of the ironies is one of the countries with the lowest mortality rate is Haiti. Yeah. Uh, and, and many of the poor. Poor uh, nation, African nations, uh, yep. Haiti. And it's because of immunity. We have a lack of immunity here in the United States. We eat bad food. We drink bad sugary things. We, and nobody yeah, talks about it. It's that. multifactorial. Often they're younger populations. So you can't, you, it's easy to stereotype. Uh, in, in the case of Haiti, uh, they take hydroxychloroquine weekly uh, for malaria. So yes, uh, that there's, there's a lot of variables going on, uh, but... It is what it is. The data are 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 what they are, and and the data are pretty clear that uh, most of the emerging economies, let's say, uh, have had much better uh, mortality rates than the Western countries. The other complication is the Western countries, in the United States notably, have overcalled uh, morbidity and mortality from COVID because they've created these perverse incentives for hospitals to diagnose people as having COVID uh, financial incentives. So um, our, our data in it's, it's totally contaminated by bias. And, and many of these countries, most of these countries, they didn't even have access to the vaccine. The vaccine was like a first world thing. Here in the United States, we had three vaccines. Most countries only had one, and there are a ton of countries that didn't have didn't even get the vaccine or it was Yet there are out very 10 important. that are licensed by the who um okay. and, and what well, the point are, is are not uh, genetic vaccines so um again uh there's been a lot of gaming going on uh throughout the world i think is the kindest way to put this well well the point is that the people there uh they just had better immunity without the vaccines or whatever. They, the, the, maybe it's a hydroxychloroquine. You said it's multifactorial. So I, I just want to share this information because people don't know about it. And when you said, hey, the vaccines are going to, they're going to um, extend the, the pandemic and, and COVID-19. By the way, I hate calling it COVID, but we'll, we'll just do it because I, I like calling it SARS too. That's really what it is. Uh, but But in any case, that's what's happened because the vaccines, they said from the start, oh, this is not 100 percent effective. Well, then it's not really a vaccine. And and then they say, oh, it's only 10 to 15 percent effective as far as mitigating symptoms, whatnot. Well, what's going to happen? The, the virus is going to mutate. It's going to mutate and it's going to keep mutating. And naturally, what I've read about natural infection is up to 80 times as strong as the jabs that they came out with. Yeah, those data are out there. Hey, so we gotta we gotta wrap up because I got another hit coming on. Sure. And I haven't had breakfast yet. Sure, that sounds good. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Robert Malone. The website is R W Malone MD. That's R W Malone MD dot com. 
check out his website if you want to hire him for, for consulting. <laughs> no, that's, that's, I really, I pretty much turned down all the consulting gigs these days. I'm, I'm booked solid. I can't hardly uh, take care of my, my horses. Uh, but the, the Malone Institute is probably the better one for the people that want to get information that relates to COVID or the World Economic Forum. So that's maloneinstitute.org. And then for our daily feed, it's uh, rwmalonemd.substack.com. And then on most of the social media platforms, Getter, Gab, Truth Social, and of course, Twitter, it's at rwmalonemd. That sounds good, Dr. Robert Malone. Thank you so much for joining us as we leave. Any final oh, thoughts? One, you want to one last thing. Yeah. Um, in theory, starting today uh, on Amazon, uh, this is useful potentially for your uh, audience. Uh, I, Jill and I have arranged with uh, Tony Lyons, uh, the leader of Skyhorse Publishing, that uh, the Kindle versions of my book, Lies My Government Told Me, Bobby Kennedy's book, The Real Anthony Fauci, and Ed Dowd's book on uh, um, this uh, cause unknown epidemic of sudden deaths in 2021 and 22. All three of those are going to be free for the next week on Kindle. So uh, if for your audience, uh, look for that. Uh, as of six this morning, Amazon hadn't flipped the switch on the freebies, but it should be coming up shortly. So you can grab those as Kindle editions if you want to read them. Okay, so you said Robert F. Kennedy's book, your book, by the way, which is titled, once again, Lies My Government Told Me in the Better Future Coming. It, that just came out. It's a number one Wall Street Journal best-selling book. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy's book, and who else is, what's the other book? Ed Dowd's, it's called Cause Unknown, The Epidemic of Sudden Deaths in 2021 and 2022. And it's a fascinating book. Many people, uh, particularly younger folks, like it because it's mostly press clippings of uh, the Very people good. that have the, the uh, uh, journalism coverage of people that have died uh, suddenly with unknown causes. Okay, so we're going to get that up on our website. And I am, I don't see it yet, but I am going to, as soon as it's turned up, by the time this episode publishes, Everything should be free for a week. So I'm going to get all them and we're going to promote it to our file. So thank you so much. I know you got to run. Uh, any other, let's just say someone got jabbed. Do we just sit back and pray or we go see a cardiologist or like what, what do we do to uh, mitigate? So it is, it is worthwhile. It turns out that by uh, troponin level, so blood test, uh, at least 50% of people have from the jab so it's it is worth getting tested and uh having a good relationship with your physician I, tested for uh, what uh, uh, uh troponin cardiac troponin cardiac um, troponin okay yeah that's the blood test uh so uh and there's others so it's you, you have to find a physician who's willing to engage with you on this and many aren't another one that you really want to do uh, for you work at home folks is get your vitamin D levels tested and make sure that they're up in the therapeutic range uh, for protection against all viruses. Uh, it's really broad based protection. And it appears that uh, really exposure to sun, which correlates with vitamin D levels, it drives the winter waves of respiratory infections that historically have plagued uh, humankind. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so get your vitamin D levels tested and try to get your weight down, uh, stay healthy, get out in the sunshine. Uh, don't just uh, stay there in front of your computer. Uh, and, um, and it is good to find a doc that you can have a good working relationship with that is willing to provide early treatment if you do get infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so all, all of the above uh, and, uh, you know, uh, be healthy, uh, live strong and uh, don't be a victim. Uh, one of the things that anyone can do that is alarmed or concerned about what's going on, particularly with the propaganda warfare, 
is learn about what fifth generation warfare is. And if, if nothing else, that will help you become immune to the psyops that's being deployed against you. And if you master those techniques and begin to practice them on social media or, or in the grocery line, you can, um, you don't have to be a victim, you can be a warrior. And I think that's super important to empower people so they don't feel like they're just passive victims of, of all this stuff that's being deployed against us. They can, they can fight back and they can do it through alternative media, social media, their daily interactions. But I also counsel, remember that everybody has been subjected to this massive PSYOPs campaign. And some people like yourself have been able to wake up or break through it or realize what's being done. Many people haven't. This is weapons grade PSYOPs technology that's been deployed on us. And I don't mean in any way to say that the likes of Tony Fauci or Rochelle Walensky should be forgiven or not held accountable. But for your, your brother, your uncle, your mother, your children, your coworker, remember that they've all been subjected to this massive PSYOPs campaign. And many of them kind of have been hypnotized by the state. And I think it's it's important to approach them with an open heart, not with hate. Uh, I'm sorry, just quick, one more quick, I'll give you 30 seconds to answer it. But you said you got long COVID. Is that a real thing? Like, like if you get COVID, it does it the, 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 the after effects, do they last a lifetime? Is that real or? Like well, it, obviously, if you have organ damage from coagulation, including brain damage, uh, that lasts a lifetime. If you have damage to your heart, that lasts a lifetime. The virus itself does cause long lasting damage and can cause. It's not as severe as many of us thought it might have been. Frankly, I thought I was going to die of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, and it was just a matter of time. And I've had pulmonary function tests that show that that's not happening to me. I'm within the normal limit, so hooray. But uh, there is a case to be made that long COVID, quote unquote, is really a post-viral syndrome, which is something that has long been known in medicine. Uh, and there's other uh, cases that can be made that the spike protein toxicity has some unique features that aren't found in most viral syndromes or post-viral syndromes and that can cause long-term damage and uh, can persist. The, the mRNA products uh, persist in your body for a remarkably long time. And so does the spike protein and the spike protein is associated with um, binding to a variety of different cell types and also platelets. It activates platelets in a very odd way. It activates uh, coagulation. This is what gives rise to these very rubber band like fibrous gray clots. And they're both the large clots that can cause infarction in your, your brain or your heart or other organs. So yeah, long COVID is a thing. It's, it's not a thing though. It's a really a complex mix of symptoms. And the best way to handle it is to find a physician that is willing to treat those symptoms and, and work you through it. And I can absolutely give a recommendation uh, to have your physician consider the treatment protocol for long COVID, it's called recovery, that is made available by FLCCC. This is this uh, um, physician group uh, frontline that uh, Paul Merrick and Pierre Corey head up, but it's many other people also. And uh, I've I've taken their, I'm just completing a course with that uh, treatment protocol for long COVID and I, and I have much more energy uh, and stamina than I had before. So there it is. Thank you, Robert Malone, for joining us on the Work From Home Show. To all our listeners, check us out at workfromhomeshow.com. That's www.workfromhomeshow.com. Get on our mailing list. Email us, hello at workfromhomeshow.com. I'm sure you have many comments about this episode. It's been awesome. I've learned so much. I thought I knew everything I needed to know about the topic. I've learned even more. Send your emails, hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Like I said, follow us on social media. Leave a review on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, whatever podcasting platform you use. And until next week, keep on working from home.